Good morning and welcome to Twin City Bible Church. As we enter Holy Week, it is good to be with you all. Spring is starting to break in, the weather is getting warm, and it is just good to be able to see one another, to worship the Lord together, and to be attentive to His mercy and His sacrifice in this Holy Week. For anything you want to follow along this morning, for the order of service, for all the lyrics to the songs, for the connection cards, all those sorts of things, those are online at tcbc.cc slash connect. So everything you could need this morning will be at that website. Uh, you can go in there. And then now we are going to do our call to worship. So if you're in the sanctuary, I invite you to stand if you're able. You can read along at home if you're watching over Zoom. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Good morning. Today is Palm Sunday. Yeah, be seated for a moment. We're going to stand up again, okay? To Fred, you just do whatever you want. Um, um, today is Palm Sunday, the day when we remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Really very much a victory parade as Jesus is entering uh, the city of David, the great king, the place where the temple is, coming as Israel's king, though not the kind of king that any of us would have expected. So um, think of our musicians today as the marching band who is leading that parade. Uh, and there will be a parade here uh, among us as well. But we're going to begin by singing a traditional hymn of the church to celebrate this day. All glory, laud, and honor. If you want to follow in the hymnals, it's uh, hymn number 204. So let's, let's stand and our, our orchestra will lead us. Yes. 
That's it. I was hoping for another verse. All right. Instead, let's sing a different song, okay? Um, our text today is really a prayer, a prayer that Paul is offering on behalf of the readers of Ephesians. Uh, and it's a prayer of, uh, asking that God be glorified and calling all of us into growth in the knowledge and understanding and likeness of Christ, in our union in Christ. And so many great hymns of the church and traditional songs center on this theme. We're also a global fellowship, so we're going from Jerusalem to New Orleans uh, with uh, a song that is often uh, uh, associated with an instrumentation not unlike what we have today. So we'll sing this, Just a Closer Walk With Me. <laughs>
Beautiful. Greet one another in the love of Christ. Thanks for stopping. You guys can wrap up your conversations. Good morning again, and welcome to Twin City Bible Church. Uh, if you're new here or if you've been here for decades, uh, our mission is to see campus and community um, transformed by Christ to renew the world, right? That coming together right on the edge of campus here with students, with community members from little kids, my you know less than one-year-old son up to um, well-advanced and mature people all coming together. As we've seen in Ephesians, uh, part of God's transformational plan to grasp the depth of his love and the goodness of the gospel is those diverse groups of people coming together and breaking down those walls that tend to stand um, between people. And we see that as we bring campus and community together to have one church unified and being transformed together. So it is good to be a part of that and it is good to be with you all for that. As we get started this morning, um, as I mentioned earlier, everything you'll need to know for this morning is on tcbc.cc connect. So uh, you can learn more about the church there if you're new. You can follow more along with what's going on in the service. If this is your first time here, we would love to meet you and learn a little bit more about you. So in the back of the foyer out there, there is a welcome center. Please stop by. We would like, like to give you a water bottle. We'd like to get to know you and introduce you to the church a little bit more. Whether you're brand new or whether you've been here many times, we would love to know that you're here. So at that website, tcbc.cc slash connect, uh, there are contact cards where you can say, hey, I'm here this morning. Um, we would love it if you would all fill those out. It helps. There are also yellow physical cards in the pews if you want to do that too. So I'm going to give us 30 seconds or so now to do it. You can go to that website, scan it up there, or the physical cards in your seats. I'll give you a moment to do that. And as you finish those filling, filling those out, uh, <clears throat> a few announcements of things coming up over the next couple weeks. So, uh, this afternoon at 2 p.m., there is a baptism class. 
excuse me, here in the sanctuary. So if you are considering being baptized, if you want to know more about what that means, what our church understands about that, that will be happening right here at 2 p.m. today. Anyone's welcome. It's not a commitment to go through with the process, but if you want to learn more about it, uh, come here and find out about that. If you um, are interested but you can't make it today, reach out to Pastor Brian, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll let you know more about it. Uh, this coming week, as you probably all realize, is Holy Week, so we have a Good Friday service. So this coming Friday at 6.30 p.m. here, this will be a service to uh, enter into the mourning, the sadness, the gravity of the crucifixion. And so this is a uh, traditional part of you know, church history for the last 2,000 years is the kind of ending the season with the depth, the weightiness of Good Friday before the joy and celebration of Easter Sunday. So that'll be 6.30 p.m. here Friday night. And then, of course, the Sunday morning, the uh, joyous um, recognition of his resurrection, Jesus' victory over death and sin. We'll be celebrating that together at 10 a.m. on Easter. So a few things about that. One, um, this is a great chance to invite people who maybe normally don't go to church that frequently, especially students. There's a lot of people that we know that maybe grew up in church, maybe are kind of interested, and they're kind of those Christmas and Easter um, Sunday kind of churchgoers. This is a great chance to invite them and let them hear the story of God's redemption for us. So uh, to help make that possible, we have invitation cards. You can get those back at the Welcome Center back there that have a little bit about, um, you know, it's kind of sort of an invitation to our Easter morning service. You can get those in the back uh, there. But we would love to see tons of people, not just our regular attenders, but tons of people come and hear the good news of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, with that, as far as kids go, so uh, there will be, nursery care will be open. Let me make sure I get this all right. But there will be no uh, kids' classes for the grade school kids. And then the preschoolers will start out in the worship service and, and um, yeah, be through the beginning. There will be a special sort of kids' time uh, in the service. And then we will dismiss the preschoolers during the uh, message. And the grade schoolers will stay in through the whole thing. Pretty sure I got that all correct. Um, Finally, uh, two weeks from now, uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., there will be uh, healing prayer time. So our shepherding council is um, a group of sort of elders at the church who pray for and care for all sorts of different needs of the congregation. So if you have anything that you want to be prayed for um, in terms of healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, anything like that, 6.30 to 7.30, two Sundays from now on the 16th, we're going to have a um, yeah, time where the shepherds will pray for you here. You don't have, it's not like a hard start and end, so you can kind of come in that window, but they would love to pray with you. Speaking of prayer, I'm going to now hand it over as we uh, enter into our congregational prayer. Good morning. My name is Sandy Lou Newport. Um, I'm one of the shepherds, and I invite you to bow your heads and join me with prayer in prayer. Oh God, we come this morning grateful for your gift of grace. We praise you, Father, for your eternal plan to unite all people in all nations into one body, and all of this through the promise of your Son, Jesus Christ. We need your unity, Lord. We need that healing power that you alone can bring, your peace and your shalom. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Forgive us when we allow divisions to reign in our personal lives, our community, and the world. Forgive us when we look on those who are different as others rather than brothers. We need you in our world. We need your healing power to end conflict and divisions in Ukraine, in Israel, in the Middle East, in Burma, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, and our own United States. Many of these conflicts are so long-standing and hard, and yet, Lord, nothing is impossible with you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We need your healing power and those with long-term illnesses and ongoing physical afflictions, and those who struggle with mental health, anxiety, and depression, and those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And we pray especially for the family of Michael Powell as um, they celebrated his life 
and his home going yesterday. Father, we ask that you would bring healing in body, soul, and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And even as we say, come, Lord Jesus, come, um, our hearts grieve. For there are mo those among our family and friends who do not yet know you or are not currently walking with you. We pray that you would be made known to them, that they might open their hearts to your goodness and your mercy. Father, that you would remove their hearts of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh to love you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We thank you for Andy and Madeline Kim as they guide students on our U of I campus to help them know you more. We pray that you would help them to love and encourage students so that they might each realize your plan and your purpose as they boldly live out their lives in faith to those around them. Guide Andy and Madeline also as parents raising precious Joseph and Samuel. We thank you this morning for Pastor Brian. We thank you, Father, for the way that he leads our TCBC congregation, modeling your grace and upholding your truth. We pray for him this morning as he speaks. We ask, Lord, that you would fill him with your spirit that you would clear the distractions in our mind, that our hearts would be open to your word today, that we might leave here changed people. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. And the elementary kids can go to kids' time now. Thank you, Sandy Lou. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all, and happy Palm Sunday. And it was pleasantly distracting to watch the children process. I did stop singing. I don't know about you. We are um, wrapping up this section of Ephesians today as we will celebrate the resurrection of our Lord next Sunday on Easter. And this sermon series has been entitled Union with Christ, and it reflects the great doctrine that Paul gives us, the first half of the book, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. We'll pick back up with the second half of Ephesians after Baptism Sunday, so in three Sundays, um, and we are encapsulating that section of Ephesians uh, with a, a different title called Glorious Church. It'll make sense when we get there, but we are today in Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 14 through 21, if you have a pew Bible, you can turn to page 568. You can also, of course, always look on the screen. I'm going to pray. Father, we need, we need you. And I pray for a revelation of your great love for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth? And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. What is the true nature of 
Christianity. I was having a conversation a little over a week ago with the missionary of the week last week, Kevin Offner, who shared a briefly here and then had a lunch. And he was telling me about his ministry at the University of Virginia and some of the inter, you know, Christian, within the Christian, um, Christians on campus, some of the dialogue that goes on is it's a very intellectual campus, started, of course, by uh, Thomas Jefferson. And so he encounters, as he will invite students, he works with graduate students and faculty, he invites people for Bible study, for prayer. Sometimes there's this pushback of, well, you know, I wish you were a little more intellectual or, uh, you know, study, you know, the Greek more or this or that, and, and, and then sort of dismissive towards his calling for prayer and things like that. What really is the nature of Christianity? Is it, is it, is it an intellectual faith? Is it doctrine? Is it experience? Is it piety? Well, Paul gives us the answers, really throughout Ephesians, but certainly here in this text. We've been talking about union with Christ. This specific, this specific text, as John mentioned earlier, is a prayer, and the title here is A Prayer to Experience Jesus. And Paul, he talks about how important it is for us to experience the Lord, not just know him. And in fact, there's three things that he gives us here. Number one, why you need him, why you need Jesus, why you need to experience him. Secondly, what you'll experience, the thing that you'll encounter, the thing that he's praying for. And lastly, what it leads to, what does it produce? Why you need him, what you'll experience, what does it lead to, what it leads to. Why you need him. Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Bow my knees, just short form or long form, for I pray. Paul's talking about prayer. He's bringing the Ephesians to the Lord in prayer a second time in his letter. And he says, to the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And on the surface, I mean, that seems probably people who are alive and people who are in heaven, but it's probably more than that. When you look at the, the language there, there's a play on words, the word father and the word family, they're connected, uh, patera and patria. And so for family, it's probably the head of the family or the head of the clan. It could be the head of the nation. And in fact, some scholars would, would even go so far as to say It probably includes in the heavenlies the spirit realm, the the angels, angelic beings, good and evil, people of all all parts of humanity. And what is what is Paul getting at there? He's saying God is he's he has authority over all. Adam named the animals; he had authority. God names all; he has authority over all. But the really important thing here is what Paul says. First, the first phrase, for this reason. What is the reason? Why do you need to know him? As Pastor John referenced last week, Paul interrupts himself in the letter. He starts off in chapter 3, verse 1, and he says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, and then he breaks off into this digression. And then he comes back in 14, he says, for this reason, and it's almost as if someone is, you know, I'm going to tell you, oh, by the way, that reminds me. And then they finish that story. And Oh, so what I was going to tell you was, that's what Paul is doing here. And so what is the reason? What is it that he's praying for? Why do you need to experience Jesus? Well, really that reason, because he's given us some things before he started to tell us, and then he's given us some more since he started to tell us, the reason really is probably a couple of reasons. But in summary, what Paul has been talking about is in Christ, you have a new center of gravity. As an individual, you no longer are your own. You've been bought with a price. You belong to him. You've been redeemed from the brokenness of this world, from the ways of the spirit realm, 
that would oppress humanity and from the very desires of your own heart. You've been redeemed from that. You have a new center of gravity in Jesus Christ, union with Christ. But not only have you been redeemed and have a new center of gravity individually, but also corporately. Whatever else you would identify with and say, well, I am of this political party or I'm this ethnicity or I am fill in the blank, that is no longer your primary identity. Your primary identity is in Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ did is he broke down in his own body on the cross the enmity between Jew and Gentile and in doing so representative of every other human enmity, conflict, so that he would create a church filled with people who on the surface would hate each other, but yet in Christ could love one another. That is powerful. And what Paul is saying is that in order for that to actually be a reality and not just be a a good mental idea, a good doctrinal statement, but a lived reality, I need to pray for you for this reason. That's the first part of the reason. The second part of the reason is, Pastor John alluded to this also last week, is that Paul is writing the apostle to the Gentiles. He is in prison. And Christians, by the way, in first century Roman Empire have no leverage, politically or otherwise. This is a group of people on the outskirts of society. No power, no leverage. For the one who represents the Gentiles who himself is a Jew, but is bringing the gospel message to the Gentiles to be in prison, there is a sense of, well, there's an inherent threat there. Well, if we follow Paul, perhaps we will end up like him. Or perhaps beyond that, they are actually facing physical threat while the, the letter is being written. There's some type of persecution that they themselves could be enduring, which is why Paul says, At the end of that comment in verse 13, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Don't lose heart. In other words, there is this great height of all of the doctrinal realities of what Jesus has done for you, and therefore, for this reason, you need to experience the Lord and his love so that you can embody that reality, but also because there is a great temptation because of the inherent persecution that I face and that you could face that you might lose heart. And for that reason, I pray for you that you would experience Jesus. That's why you need to know him. Are you losing heart? There's good news for you this morning. That leads us to, what will you experience? What what is Paul praying for? What is the thing that is supposed to happen in us in order for all these great realities to become embodied? Well, here's the thing. I bet right now you are feeling pressure. Do you feel pressure? You probably do. In fact, actually, We're all under pressure right now. And I mean that in a very physical way. You see, in in the Earth's atmosphere, in the troposphere, the, the part of the atmosphere that we're in, there is an intense pressure, air pressure. And at sea level, the the air pressure is so intense that in one square inch, we experience 14.7 pounds of pressure. What does that mean? Over Over the surface of your body, you have about a ton of pressure, air pressure, forcing, coming down on you right now. Do you feel like, do you feel pressure? Well, the reason why you don't feel that pressure, as far as I can tell you, you can talk to a physicist if you want, if you want to know more, but you actually have pressure inside of you. The reason why we're not crushed is we also have atmosphere inside of us. We breathe in oxygen and there's things. And so... But the reason why you're not crushed is because the pressure inside is at least equal to the pressure outside, right? Well, Paul knows that that is true spiritually, too. If you're not to lose heart, if the temptations of the world are to not make you cave in, 
If the persecution of what it means to identify as being a, a Christian in your field of study, in your career, in academia, on your job, in your family, et cetera, et cetera if, that is, if, if, if that's not going to crush you, the only way that that won't crush you is if there is enough pressure inside you to resist. Don't lose heart. Which is why Paul's prayer, starting in verse 16, he, he's, he's getting at the heart. He's getting at the inner life, the inner being of the Christian. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit. Where? In your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. And I'll pause there for a moment. Why is Paul praying for Jesus to dwell in the hearts of the Ephesians when he's already told them that Christ dwells there? You read chapter 1, you, you see they're, they're sealed in the Holy Spirit. They have been, you know, raised with Christ. They've been seated with him etc., etc. Jesus already lives in their heart. Why is, he, why is it so important that Paul is saying, I'm going to pray, and I will pray, and I do pray that Christ will dwell in your heart? Well, if we've looked closely, Paul's already done this sort of praying for the thing that seems as if and actually is already there before as well. In the first prayer, in the f- chapter 1, he prays that the Spirit would give them a sense of knowledge that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. They already have the spirit. They already have Christ. What is Paul saying? What is he doing? Well, what he's doing is he's saying this. As a Christian, you have a robust faith. You have, at the same time, a status or static aspect to your faith and a dynamic aspect. To your faith. A status and something dynamic. What do I mean? A status. When Becca and I first got married, I remember the, it's like early, the early days, the early, early, early days of marriage, like newlywed days. You know, sometimes you, you, know, you go to sleep at night, maybe you have a bad dream, or I don't know, you just wake up and you're grogging and you're like, where am I? And, and there's that moment, that fleeting moment, you're like, you forgot you were married. I'm not sure if you're laughing at me or laughing with me, but <laughs> I'll keep going. But then you look over and you're like, oh, that's right. I'm married. And, 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 and there's a sense of status. We have a marriage. There is a status. It brings comfort. You have a status of being in Christ. It brings comfort. You're not this day in Christ, tomorrow out of Christ, in feeling just, where am I? Does he love me? Does he not love me? No, no, no. He, you're good. He's got you. You are in him. But there's also this dynamic aspect of our relationship where he wants you to experience him more and more. You see, early when we were married, it wouldn't have been enough for me to just be content with the fact that I have the status of being married and just go about my life as I did before. But there's this exciting element of, I get to know the person to whom I'm married. I get to get to know her more and share my thoughts and hear her thoughts and develop intimacy. And Paul is saying that Christ would dwell in your hearts, that he would actually take up residence, that he would actually call it home that he would come in and start rearranging things in your heart, rearranging and and dealing with attitudes and and rearranging values. Similar to how when I got married, my wife started rearranging things. (laughs) I lived, I had stacks of paper. What is this mess? Oh, I know where everything is. I do taxes. I have an old calculator. Oh, wait, I got 15 lines down of computations. I made a mistake. Let me start over. She brought order into my life. Stack of paper. Okay, that goes in the trash. (laughs) And she keeps telling me, do you miss it? And you're right. I don't miss it. I don't even know what was in the stack by now. And the funny thing is, 
now I like things to be neat, right? Because she came in and she's dwelt in, we've dwelt together, and I like what she likes. And that's what Paul is getting at. Paul, when Jesus comes and he, he, he really dwells in your heart and he takes over and he starts rearranging and giving you a new sense of who you are. It changes your, it changes your values. It changes your desires. You don't want the things that you wanted before, before you knew him. You want the things that he wants. It's dwelling. It's this dynamic aspect. It, it really is. The, it's, it's, it's the, that's what happens when revival happens. Is people who they identify in the status of Christianity, they come back into contact with this dynamic nature of what it means to serve the living God. Status and dynamic. This rearranging. But Paul goes on to say, to be rooted Verse 17, the second half, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you see what Paul is getting at? There's this great height of what We are in Christ. Paul wants them to know it, to live it, to embody it. Yet there's this great temptation, and Paul's saying, don't lose heart. And he knows that if you experience the love of Jesus, you get filled up with the fullness of God. There are so many times when I get discouraged. And you, you see, when you get discouraged, you see the world a certain way. You think everything is going wrong. Or, you know, you just begin to have exp- expectations for things change. You expect things to go wrong. But I know so many times, many, many times, it's in those moments when I can just get into the presence of God and experience his love changes everything doesn't change my circumstances immediately, but it changes how I engage with them. That's what Paul is saying. It's one thing to know in your mind that honey is a sweet object. It's another thing to taste it. And there's an aspect of our faith where Paul is saying, you need to taste and see that the Lord is good, to taste his love. And it's in tasting the love of Jesus, in experiencing the love of Jesus, you get filled up. Now, all of a sudden, the pressure inside can withstand whatever's going on around me. That's what he wants for you. He wants that for you. What does this result in? What does this lead to? Our last point. Verses 20 and 21, Paul shifts his attention. He was talking to and praying for the believers in Ephesus. Now he's shifting his attention. And he says in 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I mentioned earlier that in my conversation with Kevin, he was explaining this sort of, I don't know if it's really a full conflict, but point of tension between those that would say, well, faith is intended to be this intellectual experience. And those that would say, well, well, there's this pietist experience. Can you see how that's really a silly conversation? Paul's movement in Ephesians, he starts off with this amazing doctrine. Chapter 1, 1 through, you know, 
four, 13, 14, whatever it is, and then he moves into prayer. Theology ought to lead you to something. It is not something for itself. It ought to lead you to prayer. It ought to lead you to prayer. And then as Paul begins to pray, as he does here, he, he gave this great theology, what Jesus has done for you, how he's given you this new center of gravity, which, which by the way, I mean, I love that idea. David Paulison, who's a, psychologist, a Christian psychologist, he, I, I got that idea from him. But then not just a new center of gravity individually, but also corporately, this amazing doctrine it leads Paul to say, I want you to experience this. It moves, from, it moves from theology and doctrine and things in our head, and it moves directly to pietistic prayer. And then as you experience him, it leads you to worship. Now to him. It leads you to glory in who God is, to glory in his triune nature. I mean, even the way Paul frames his prayer, though he only mentions rather this doxology. Though he only mentions Jesus Christ by name, all three persons of the Trinity are present. Now to him, that is the Father. According to the power at work within us, he's just told us in chapter or verse 16, through the Spirit, he would strengthen you with power through the Spirit. The one who is Animating power in your spirit is the Holy Spirit. And he names Jesus Christ as the one to, to receive the glory. When the Holy Spirit comes in your life, he's always inviting you to know Jesus. He's never consumed with himself. And when you encounter Jesus, Jesus is always pointing to the Father. That's how he lived his ministry. Within the Trinity, no one is pointing to his own person. And Paul, he gets raptured up in his mind and in his spirit into the wonder of who God is. That as high as this prayer is that he's just prayed, he's saying, you know what? God can do even more than that. You need to know him. You need to experience him. It will cause you to worship. Have you been losing heart? Do you see how if you experience the love of Jesus, it will bring encouragement and hope and fill you up? And the reality is, as we have received a new identity, a new center of gravity, being in Christ, the reality is that the pressures of the world, the idols of our own heart, or other means, the social, the social pressure that we may feel, it can lead us to want to root back into our natural identities. And here's what I mean. Well, in 2016, okay, so, you know, there was an election that year. Happens every four. There was a New York Times article that talked about after the election in 2016, how in the church in the United States, as we were talking, about, which by the way, you know, Paul's got this whole Jew and Gentile racial ethnic undertone here. How in the church in the United States after that, lots of people of color left multi-ethnic churches because of how churches dealt with the election. Now, I'm not here to talk about politics, I'm talking about the the cultural impact within the church community, right? There's always, there's always reasons to move back towards your natural interest. It is hard to be multi-generational, multi-ethnic. No one should think that that is easy. It is difficult. I mean, what, mu what music are we going to play, Right? If you, if you come to church thinking, you know, hey, every, every week I'm going to get my music, I'm sorry. That's not a reality. But there's something beautiful about connecting to the breadth of the church globally and in time, and then the musical expression to remind us, hey, 
The kingdom's not actually centered around any one of us or our people. We have a new center of gravity. But my point, though, is lots of people began losing heart because of, well, I can't, I, it's this whole multi-ethnic thing is just too hard. You need to experience his love. Peter, the apostle, even he fell into this. Paul records this in Galatians chapter 2. Peter, you know, Jews don't eat with Gentiles, don't eat what they eat. They don't eat shrimp and all that sort of stuff. Peter started eating shrimp and hanging out with the Gentiles until the Jewish brothers came from Jerusalem. And Peter's like, oh, um, you know, the Gentiles are like, hey, come on, join us. He's like, oh, um, sorry, I can't do that. Paul calls him out on his hypocrisy. Peter slips back into identifying himself. Hey, I'm a Jew. Paul's like, no, no, no. You are a Christian. Don't lose heart. God wants to encourage you. The demonic structures of our world are working to bring disunity. Jesus is building a beautiful unity in his bride, the church. Don't lose heart. Maybe for some of you, you're same-sex attracted, and you want to follow a traditional view of what Scripture is saying, but it becomes burdensome to think about the lived realities of other believers, those that are married, those that are seemingly having things go their way. Don't lose heart. Jesus wants you to experience his love. By the way, remember, there's one citizenship that we all share. There's one access point. His name is Jesus. There's not two. Maybe even you are at a point in your life, and I don't want to, I don't mean to make this seem trite at all, but you're questioning what is your, even your, your gender. And even in that, there can, there's, a, there's the program that the world would give you about that. But Jesus invites you into a new center of gravity in how you identify yourself in Christ to experience his love like together with all the saints, as Paul says. You see, all of us, there's something that we could point back to. It's easier for churches to build around their political persuasion or their ethnic representation or whatever the case is. It is so much more difficult to actually live out this unity that Paul is saying and the apostle to the Jews or to the Gentiles is now in prison. But Paul is saying, don't lose heart. Let's pray. Father, you want us to not just know that we have a new identity in Christ. You want us to experience that. You want us to experience your love. You want us to experience, Lord, that we have been made new creatures and creations in Jesus Christ. Lord, may we as a community be filled up to the fullness of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't think of a better thing to do after studying that prayer than to come to the Lord's table. Because it's in the table of the Lord that we are invited by Jesus to truly experience him, to fill up in the fullness of God. I want to invite you to stand as we, as a church, will fix ourselves in the global historic church by reciting the Apostles' Creed. TCBC, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is received by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he moved on to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the remittance of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Communion is, a, is, is Jesus inviting us to receive from him afresh and making our faith something that we can actually come into physical contact with, to, reminder, to be a, a reminder to us that Jesus came incarnate, that God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, came incarnate to identify with you. I'm going to invite our communion servers to come forward and I will pray over the elements. We will take of them together. If you don't know the Lord, this meal is not for you, but this is a time of reflection, and no one is going to judge you if you don't take the elements. You can reflect on what would it mean for me to find my identity in Jesus Christ, and perhaps this is an opportunity for you to respond to that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus and thank you, Jesus, that you would identify with us, that we might identify with you. We thank you for giving us of your own body and blood shed for us on the cross and giving us communion that we could, by faith, experience you in a new and fresh way. Bless these elements. In Jesus' name, amen.
As today it is Palm Sunday, it's the first day of Holy Week, the week of Jesus' passion. And it is on the night that he was betrayed that he gave his most, he gave his best before he would be giving of his life. And he says, this is my body, broken for you, for you. And he bids that his disciples would take and eat and receive the body of Christ broken for you. On that same night, and in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It is the blood of Jesus that secures our status of being in Christ and gives us the basis for experiencing the dynamic relationship with Christ. Let's take the cup together.
Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, we do pray that we would, as a church body, have that love of Christ move from an abstraction, from an intellectual reality to an experienced one that would move our center of gravity, move our center of identity to in him and experience that more and more. Shortly here, we are going to respond with our um, tithes and offerings. So if you want to give, you can find the link for that online at tcbc.cc slash connect. Also, there will be offering plates coming by. You can put money in there. You can also put your yellow connect cards in those as those go by. Um, so yeah, the ushers are going to come past the plates. And then um, after the plates have gone by, we'll join in singing with the band behind me. We're singing two songs, both of which continue the kind of prayer that Paul offers in Ephesians uh, that we've already begun to pray in our earlier singing. Um, one is an older song, almost 100 years old. Uh, the other one, I remember from the 1970s.
been wonderful to worship with you all. Hope to see you on Good Friday and look forward to celebrating the resurrection next Sunday. The benediction, of course, comes from the passage. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing the doxology. <laughs> and have a great week.